Okay, um, my name is Lisa Eriksson and I will be your guide uh, during this seminar. I'm the head of the department KTH Innovation and I'm also CEO of KTH Holding, which is the investment arm of KTH. Before we invite our American guests, um, I would like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit more of, about what we do here at KTH Innovation. But first I have a question for you. How many of you have heard about KTH Innovation before? Oh, we need a picture on this. <laughs> Almost all of you, thank you. Um, well, in the year 2007, um, for, I have to apologize about the slides. There is actually, there is a light up there and we can't do anything about it. We have tried, but it's, it's uh, difficult to see, I know. Uh, we will see if the sun changes, it might be better. Um, back to, yeah, back in 2007, I was given the mission to start a new department at KDH. And together with my team, I built a department that is recognized both nationally and internationally for its highly ranked innovation support. Since the start, we have supported more than 1,000 researchers and 1,600 students, um, and more than 230 companies have been formed. Uh, our support process has been copied both in Sweden and internationally, and innovation has become a very important part of the KTH brand, and uh, is one key in climbing in rankings for KTH. And this was uh, proven true when Times Higher Education, now in April, they launched a new uh, ranking list called the uh, University Impact Rankings. And KTH ranked number seven worldwide on impact connected to the UN Sustainability Goals. And, <laughs> thank you. And on the goal number three, no, number nine, innovation and infrastructure, we actually ranked number three in the world. So that's even a bigger applause, thank you. Um, so, as the innovation support unit at the largest technical university, uh, we have adopted a mindset that sets us apart from many of our international counterparts. We work hard at enabling innovation instead of controlling it and maximizing profits from it. We arrange ideation workshops, we inspire innovative thinking and creative idea generation. We are open to everyone at KTH and we never turn anyone away if their idea fits our scope. Uh, instead, our structure process allows us to, uh, and the idea owners, to carefully access their merits and the ideas together with us. Everyone in my team has relevant business experience and uh, from different market tech technologies. We provide proof of concept funding, which is extremely important for, um, for the teams that we support and we help to build great teams. And this is also something that is very unique for us. We, we, we connect into the ecosystem of, of Stockholm and we bring in experienced entrepreneurs and people that have done similar journeys to before and together with our partners we, we create good teams that can really excel in the future. Um, we strongly believe that getting an idea is the easy part. Um, the search for a value proposition and a relevant business model is much harder. And what really counts is what you see up here, it's execution. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. okay. So, um, we strive to create a truly international, innovative environment where people from all sectors of society, could be students, alumni, researchers, business developers, business angels, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, industry partners, meet to tackle the really big challenges. And all of these that I just mentioned are actually here today. This is such a, uh, an event where we can meet and, and talk with them to, to support, um, to, to try to find solutions for the really big challenges. And we believe this is a success for universities uh, all over the world. So, with that said, um, I would like to uh, move on to the keynote speaker of this seminar. And it's time to welcome uh, our American guest, Dr. Robert Langer. 
Uh, and before I need to, this is a, before I ask you up on stage, I will read a short sentence about your, your amazing background. Robert is a David H. Koch Institute professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a true pioneer in research and commercialization. He is one of 13 institute professors at MIT, a position that is considered to be one of MIT's highest honors. He has received more than 220 major awards and is one of four living individuals to have received both the United States National Medal of Science and the United States National Medal of Technology and Innovation. Langer's research is at the interface of medicine, material science, and chemical engineering. And as a science envoy for innovation, Dr. Langer will focus on novel, novel approaches for biomaterials, drug delivery systems, nanotechnology, and test tissue engineering, and the US approach to research commercialization. Langer has over 1,300 patents, <laughs> really amazing, and started more than 30 spin offs and is currently tied in the fourth place as the most cited person in history in any field. It's estimated that his work has impacted over two billion lives. So please welcome uh, Dr. Langer up on stage with a big applause. So I'm so glad that you chose to come to, to, to KTH and visit us. Is this your first visit here? No, no, actually not, uh, but I, uh, th I think the third, but okay. it's still my pleasure. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, should, should I start? Yeah, oh, okay. the floor is yours. So thank you so much. Well, really, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. You know, normally, and in fact, the other two times I came to KTH, I gave more of a science lecture. And I'll, I'll talk about some science today, but really the goal, I think, that people wanted me to do here was talk about how we took the science and actually made spinoffs and tried to bring it to the world. And, you know, at MIT, we almost always start with formulas. Um, and I don't know how easily with the light people can see this, but I'll, I'll try to take you through it. But I've, I've, as I looked at what we've tried to do, usually there's always been like about six elements uh, when we've done this. One, when we've created these things in the lab, they're usually what I call platform technologies, which means like a drug delivery system you could use for drug A, drug B, drug C. And, and then also uh, what we've done is usually we've made products out of them, maybe for all of those drugs. Um, Again, since we're an academic institution, we like to publish papers, and we've tried to publish these papers in top journals like Science or Nature. But the other thing we've done, which was alluded to in the introduction, is that every time we publish something, we also patent something, uh, or almost every time. And, 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 and a lot of times people say, well, don't those conflict with each other? I don't think so. I think actually we, we, we've never held up a paper ever, but we've patented uh, you know, a lot of the things that we've done. Um, now, a lot of the companies I'm going to talk about are more medical in nature. And so we've always wanted to have not just an idea, but actually probably have done four or five years of research in the lab at MIT showing that at least it works in animals. And the last point I wanted to make is that every one of these times we've done it, it's been our students who have played a key role. Usually they've spent those four or five years in the lab you know, developing something for their thesis or their postdoctoral work, and they've wanted to see this happen. And so many of them have joined the company in key roles. So I thought I'd tell you six or seven stories about this. Um, and the first one, and, and a lot of this doesn't come because we started with a particular company in mind. You know, a lot of it's basic research. So the first one actually goes back to when I was a postdoc in the 70s, and I was trying to isolate what were then called angiogenesis inhibitors, molecules that would stop blood vessel growth. And people didn't even think they existed, and uh, I was working with a man named Judah Folkman. He was my postdoc advisor. And, and the biggest problem since people didn't think they existed, is we had to have a way to study how blood vessels grew. And the molecules that we were trying to isolate, they were 
that could hopefully stop blood vessels from growing were pretty large molecules, like over 300 molecular weight, sometimes even proteins. And there wasn't any way to study them. So we had to have a way to deliver them uh, in the body, or in at least an animal, uh, for pretty long periods of times, like weeks, if not months. And um, so, so that's how we started. Now, that really, at, in 1974, when we started, it had almost no importance other than this angiogenesis work. But as time came, as things moved forward, you know, people started making large molecules, and it was very hard to take large molecules orally. Uh, and if you injected them, usually they had very short half-lives. So it would end up being critical in many cases to have a way to deliver these molecules in an unaltered form and protect them from harm. But when we first started this work, I remember Dr. Folkman, he was an advisor to the only company in the world that was even trying to develop what we call slow-release medicines. And he asked some of the experts there, could they help us? But they said, well, they couldn't because everybody was using polymers to deliver these molecules by slow diffusion. And the people at the company just said, well, that won't happen because large molecules can't slowly diffuse through polymers any more than, say, we could walk through a wall. Actually, the literature said the same thing. This is just a quote just saying uh, how you couldn't do this. And, and sometimes I think the only reason uh, that we maybe ended up solving the problem is, is I, I just hadn't read any of this. So, so I kept trying. And I spent several years uh, working on this. And I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. But eventually, I made little microspheres. Now you can adapt our procedures and make nanospheres. Here's a picture of one and one cut in half. And we did publish in Nature in 1976 the fact that you could use this to release molecules of, of virtually any size for over 100 days. And this would then lead us to actually isolating those angiogenesis inhibitors and so forth. But, uh, but at any rate, it, so we could release these molecules. We even worked out ways to release them at constant rates uh, by using certain mathematical modeling approaches. But when I first presented this work to the scientific community, I remember it was 1976, and I had to give, so I was 27 years old, uh, and I was giving this talk to this really distinguished audience of polymer chemists and engineers in, in a big conference in the United States. And I remember giving this talk, and I practiced it for weeks, and when I got done with the talk, I thought I did okay, because I didn't forget too much of what I was going to say. I, I thought all these older scientists, being nice people, w would want to encourage me, this young guy. But when I got done, I stepped off the podium and a whole bunch of them came up to me and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> they said, again, that the large molecules couldn't diffuse through the polymers and that, uh, uh, that, that even the solvents we were using would destroy the molecules we put in. So, and actually things kind of went downhill from there, if that were possible. Um, so, so first, you know, I, I, I tried to get uh, grants for the work, and my first nine grants were rejected. And then, uh, you know, I like, really like being a postdoc, but a lot of my friends told me that probably it's not good to do a postdoc your whole life. And, 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 and so I started applying for faculty positions in chemical engineering, which was my discipline. But no chemical engineering department in the world actually wanted to hire me. They all thought this bio stuff I was trying to do didn't make any sense in, in chemical engineering. By the way, you know, when I worked at the hospital, I was the only engineer in the hospital. Things have changed a lot since the 1970s. But anyhow, so I, I couldn't get any jobs in a chemical engineering department. Finally, a nutrition department at MIT hired me. And, and, and the reason I think they hired me was because the guy, Nevin Scrimshaw, he was the head of the department. He was what I'd call kind of a benevolent dictator kind of professor. And what I mean by that is he liked me, so he offered me a job, but he didn't bother to ask the rest of the department what they thought. And, and that probably would have been okay, except for one thing, which was that the year after I joined the department, he left. So a lot of the senior faculty decided to give me advice, and, and their advice is, is I ought to leave too. And, and, and this is actually a, a direct quote. One of my good friends, Mike Marletta, he uh, is a in, member of the National Academy of Sciences and very uh, famous chemist. He, he was just telling this, giving a speech a few years ago uh, about me, uh, and this refers back to 1980. And he said, one evening I went to a faculty dinner at a Chinese restaurant with myself and some senior MIT uh, 
professors. He said, a senior scientist sat quizzing us while smoking a cigar. He said, when the older scientist heard my concepts for polymeric drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my face and said, you better start looking for another job. Mike said he thought he was in a Fellini movie. Um, anyhow, I kind of kept at it. We did basic research again to understand how this worked. Just to maybe show you one aspect of it, we take a cryomicrotome and cut thin sections through the polymer, and normally it looked like this. It was a sheet. So even molecules two or three hundred molecular weight couldn't go from one side to the other. But it turns out the way we made them actually caused intricate pores to be formed. And these pores, it turns out, had, were incredibly winding and tortuous and they had tight constrictions between them. So it took a really long time for the molecules to get through. Myself, uh, if, if you've ever been to my hometown, Boston, I sometimes say to people, it's kind of like driving a car through Boston. And, and over the years, our students figured out ways by mathematical modeling to predict uh, how you could do this. And you could now design systems to last from anywhere from a day to um, m many years. And one of my other students, Larry Brown, did show that you could use this uh, in animal models. Here he's releasing insulin from a little tiny pill for over 100 days with a single injection. And Dr. Folkman said to me uh, one day, he said, Bob, we should file for a patent. You know, that might seem common today, but in the 1970s, Children's Hospital, where I was working, they never had a patent. So we filed for a patent the first time. And five years in a row, the patent examiner rejected it. So the the head of the tech transfer office for the hospital uh, came down to see me. He said, Bob, you're wasting the hospital an enormous amount of money. He said, just quit. Give up. It's never going to get allowed. The patent examiner doesn't understand this. Uh, so, but I don't, I don't like to give up. So I started to think, you know, obviously we kept trying to explain it to the examiner, but science wasn't working. So I started to think, is there some way we can convince him to allow the patent, uh, legally, of course, and... And, and, um, and, and, and I, as I told you, when we first started doing this, everybody said this was impossible, it couldn't work. I wondered if anybody ever wrote that down. So, I, so now we're in 1982, and I did what's called a science citation search, which means looking back at our 1976 Nature paper to see who wrote things about it. And I found uh, a number of articles. I'll just show you one in particular, and I'll read you this quote. It's from five of the top polymer chemists in the world at that time. And I'll just read you what they were writing. I had no idea it was written. But they said, generally, the agent to be released is a relatively small mo molecule with a molecular weight no larger than a few hundred. One would not expect that macromolecules, for example, proteins, could be released by such a technique because of their extremely small permeation rates through polymers. However, Folkman and myself have reported some surprising so it's surprising. That's a really good word for a patent examiner. Some surprising results that clearly demonstrate the opposite. So I showed that to the uh, tech transfer person, and he was very excited. He flew down to Washington to see the patent examiner, and the patent examiner said, I had no idea. He said, I tell you what, I will allow this patent if Dr. Langer can get written affidavits from each of these five people that they really wrote this. <laughs> it's, it's a true story. So... I wrote each of them. I was this young professor, and they were all nice enough to write me back that they really wrote it. And we got this incredibly broad patent. And with that patent, we would uh, start teaching people how to use it. We'd license it. In fact, one of the things, though, that happened is, uh, I, you know, for a while, nobody would ever use this stuff. But, but then I'd get calls from several multi-billion dollar companies, Eli Lilly and International Minerals and Chemicals, and both of them wanted me to be a consultant for them, and I told them about the patent, and they licensed it. They gave me a consulting fee. They gave our lab a big grant. But mostly what I was excited about is that they were going to develop it. But what happened was with these big companies is they do a few experiments, and they didn't work out the right way, so they kind of gave up. So that was really depressing to me. So a couple of years later, Alex Klebanoff, a very good friend of mine, he said to me, Bob, we should start our own company. So we started this little company, Enzatech, um, with uh, four of my students. Uh, and then we did, the uh, thing was, our, and we got some venture capital. Our CEO actually wasn't that good, which was unfortunate. That's actually a key thing, having a good CEO. But it turned out the, the comp there was a company right downstairs from us, Alchemies, and they had a technology that wasn't working trying to deliver drugs across the blood-brain barrier, but had a very good CEO, Richard Pops. So we did this merger. And today, Alchemies, uh, based on this, has 25 products that are FDA-approved or in clinical trials. 
Many of them are these little microspheres that I showed you for different treatments. One treats schizophrenia. One is one of the major ways today of preventing opioid addiction. Others are used for type 2 diabetes and others still for, for alcoholism and other things. And, and they've done very well. Um, have 2,000 employees and market capitalization of about $5 billion. So since we did this, some of the people in my lab over the years, I said, well, let's do it again and again. So, uh, so I'll tell you a few more stories. So a couple of years later, David Edwards, he was a postdoc with me. He came to the lab and actually had never done, he was a chemical engineer, but he had never done an experiment before. He mostly did mathematical modeling. One of the things he modeled were uh, the lung. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, I think that maybe what we could do is there's this real big problem in drug delivery, which is giving aerosols, you know, inhalation therapy. Usually it turns out if you give an aerosol, you're lucky if you get 2% from the device into the lung. And, 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 and we started looking into that. Why do you get so little with, with, with doing that? And, and it's a huge problem because, of course, not only is the expense if you have get 2%, but you need a giant inhaler for almost everything. So... The reason is, is that people always thought if you made aerosols um, bigger than about two microns, they'd settle in the back of your throat. But if you make them two microns or less, then it's, they're, they're super tiny, so they stick together. It's kind of like wet sand. They aggregate. They stick together in the inhaler, in the air, in the mouth, so you almost get nothing by the time you get in the lung. So people tried to solve this problem for many years. Almost always they tried to solve it by mechanical engineering approaches, by designing better inhalers to break apart those sand-like aggregates. And they'd go from 2% to 3% in the best case, which is a big deal because you make it 50% smaller and save 50% in the cost, but still 3% is not great. Nobody, though, ever, ever thought about changing the aerosol. People, like most aerosols, are sort of water meter dose inhalers and nebulizers. But what people started doing around that time was making what we call dry powder inhalers. And whether they were liquids or solids, the density of those powders was almost always one gram per cc. And, our th and so I mentioned this to David, and what we started talking about was what if we, rather than make aerosols that are non-porous and small, what if we made them very porous and large? So they might have a density of 0.1 gram per cc. And he calculated by his modeling that if you did that, that even these big aerosols would not settle because they were so porous, because of their aerodynamics, they wouldn't settle in the back of your throat. But because they were big, they wouldn't stick together, right? Like wet basketballs aren't going to stick together like wet sand. And also because they're big, they're not going to get destroyed that easily. You know, normally if you get something into the lung, you have macrophages that eat these particles, like eating a small meal, which doesn't take long. But now it's like eating a big meal. It takes longer. And, and so we thought we might do better. And we tested this first. Uh, in, in, oh, we actually made some of these. This may be hard to see, uh, but it's a scanning electron micrograph. And these actually, I'll give you a sports analogy. Before we did anything, uh, before our work, all aerosols look like little golf balls or little baseballs. Now they look like what are called wiffle balls. They're super porous. Uh, and when we um, give them in vitro, uh, you have what's called an Anderson impactor. You get 10 times more in, which was striking compared to what people had done before. If you do an in vivo experiment, uh, looking at uh, now small animals, you also get t uh, ten t at least 10 times more in. And if you do human experiments, we even got um, the systems to last for three days, which was unprecedented for aerosols. So once again, uh, we published this. We published this in science, uh, and we patented it. And again, we got a very broad patent. Uh, some of the key elements uh, of that patent are particles that have a density of less than 0.4 grams per cc. Normally, like I say, they're even 0.1 gram per cc. But the particles are much bigger. And, and the key thing I want to show you is that the patents are very, very broad. It's, it says agent, so it could be any agent that you wanted to deliver. And David also, he wanted to start a company. He had gone to Penn State, and then he called me up. He said, I really want to get this out to the world. So we started this little company, AIR. The initial study, just a brief summary, the initial studies were done in 1996, published it in Science in 1997. We started the company in 1998, and, and then he decided he didn't want to do this forever, but people were really excited about the technology, and uh, 
we got many pharmaceutical companies like Lilly and Glaxo and Pfizer wanting to use it. And, and that's how we helped finance the company because they would keep giving us more and more money. Uh, and we were in two clinical trials. And then in 1999, uh, like there was at least four companies that wanted to buy it. Um, and and uh, David decided he didn't want to do this forever. So uh, we, we sold it and uh, the investors made over a thousand percent IRR. I have to say when we first did this, I didn't know what IRR meant, uh, but it's like a sort of an annualized return. So a thousand percent, and I, I wish everything I did was close to that. And, and, and we also, you know, David spun off a nonprofit uh, based on this to help develop these things for the third world. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and then there was a spin-off, and that spin-off uh, was is now part of a quarta, and that they, they uh, have gotten approval, for example, for uh, new treatments for uh, Parkinson's. This is actually quite striking, because again, it, it, normal aerosols you can't give very much, but now you can give something like up to 70 milligrams. Before this, you could give maybe two or three milligrams. Now, in a single simple inhaler like this, you can get 70 milligrams. So people that have Parkinson's disease, one of the biggest problems is what are called off episodes. And, and you can't take it orally because the enzymes end up destroying the drug. So now you just take this and it, it uh, hopefully will help a lot of patients. The next example is, an, is a little different. This is biomolecules. You know, people that started up, uh, companies on proteins, which are what are called monodisperse. In other words, all insulins are about 6,000 uh, molecular weight. Uh, they had started uh, companies on uh, DNA, like genomics companies, but nobody had ever started a, a polysaccharide company before. And we had done a lot of work in our lab on, on enzymes that could affect polysaccharides. So we made a couple discoveries, uh, myself and our students. And that would lead to the first approaches ever to really sequence complex polysaccharides. Just briefly from a, um, a, you know, a, a scientific standpoint, the techniques involve a couple of things. One is cutting these polysaccharides like heparin, and this is also true for glycoproteins, but you cut the polysaccharides with enzymes we'd isolated like heparinases or heparanases. In fact, the first publications on that go back to things that I did in, published in Science in 1982. Once you cut them, you sequence them with mass spec, and then we develop mathematical models. So my students, Ram Sassaskaran and Ganesh Venikatraman, published in Science, that you could uh, you develop mathematical models which could put these pieces back together, and you could get a full sequence. So that could lead to uh, potential products like new heparins, other comp complex polymers, new glycoproteins, and we started this company, Momenta. Um, and we started it again with two of our students, Ram, who stayed at MIT, and Ganesh, who went on to run all the research at the company, which at one point had over 400 people. And uh, it, we got venture investments, and then we went public. And then we got four major deals over the years to help keep financing the company as we were trying to develop products. And in 2000, um, uh, and, and, and so what happened is all these companies, Novartis, Baxter, Mylan, and so forth, would fund it. But then one of the products that we had in mind was a, a Lovenox. That's a, a low molecular weight heparin. And, and that was a $4 billion drug, but going off patent. And, and this was what we'd call a biogeneric. And lots of bigger companies like Teva tried to make it, but they didn't have a way to really do it, even though the, all the stock analysts said they would be out with it very early. Now we're nine years later and, and they and others still aren't. But, um, but we were able to begin because we had the sequencing ability to do this. And that led to really the first Lovenox biogeneric approved by the FDA. And it was actually the largest syringe launch in history, uh, selling uh, over a billion dollars a year. And then we did the same thing with Capaxone um, and, and a few years later. And this just is what the drug looks like. Um, and of course, the company did well when that happened. But I wanted to tell you one additional story. And that is about 11 years ago, a whole bunch of people started dying of what's called tainted heparin, contaminated heparin. And I had once been chair of the FDA science board. That was their highest advisory board. And they called me up, and, and also Ram, my student, and they said, well, could we help them? So because all this contaminated heparin came in, and this actually led to deaths in 22 countries, hundreds and hundreds of deaths, and they had no idea what caused it. So what we did is, it was a, a really, I think, the only time I've seen this happen. So we had a collaboration between MIT, 
which was us, Momenta, which was the company, the US FDA, and the United States Center for Disease Control, the CDC. And that led to these three papers, uh, which were published quite quickly, showing what, what the contaminant was. This is in Nature, Biotech, and then two articles in the New England Journal of Medicine showing uh, all what happened and how to stop it. And after this, there were no more deaths. So that was actually, I think, a, a real example of the good that companies can do. Now, the next example that I wanted to give you uh, is a, a little bit different. Um, you know, most of the things we end up doing, you know, are ideas that I've had myself or some of the students. But in 2007, I got a call from the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, Julia Greenstein, and she said, you know, one of the biggest problems that they face is they want to make an artificial pancreas, but every time they try to make a pancreas, they use a certain molecule called alginate, and then when they put it in the body, it gets encapsulated with fibrous tissue. And she says about 20 companies have started on this. The government itself has spent billions of dollars and it's failed over and over again. She said, is there some way you can develop super, you know, because we do a lot in materials, is there some way we could develop super biocompatible materials? So uh, with Dan Anderson, he was one of my postdocs at the time. Now he's a professor at MIT. We had this idea of, of developing new combinatorial approaches to make these molecules and characterizing them. And just to show you some pictures, this is alginate, uh, which, and you can, the beauty of alginates is that you can do a water-based encapsulation, and that's very good if you're putting mammalian cells in it, because the mammalian cells, you know, if you used organic solvents, which is usually what's done, would, um, you know, would die. So, but alginate itself will cause this fibrous reaction. So, for the chemists in the audience, we made literally hundreds, if not thousands, of derivatives, and uh, these are a few pictures, and I, I should say almost all of them did not work, but three of them did, and even in primates, you could put them in, and non-human primates, and you wouldn't get encapsulation over six months. And just to show you some striking pictures, we actually took FDA-approved catheters. I don't know, again, how easily this is seen, but if you normally put those catheters in an animal, you get a lot of fibrous tissue. If you put them coated with our stuff, you get almost none. And um, we actually have published six. There will now be a seventh paper in different nature journals, uh, sh really outlining all the sort of fundamentals of this so that you don't get encapsulation and you even know what receptors to go after and things like that. And, and, and really, I think that one of the things that I wanted to say about this is I have to give the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation a lot of credit. The first seven years they funded us, we published nothing. But they believed in us and they believed this was a big problem. So then what we were able to do is publish all these papers and we're, we have another one coming out. And uh, we were able to show with a cell line, this is a Doug Melton cell line at Harvard, that you could really cure diabetes in animals. So once again, we started a company because we want to get it to patients. And the initial funding, like I say, was about $18 million from the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. But then we got $23 million a couple of years ago from Flagship Ventures. That's one of the local venture firms. But again, the way we finance these companies is you want to get a large company to come in because they have much greater resources. But we still have the leverage of the small company, which has this passion to drive things through. So Eli Lilly last year gave us $500 million, $80 million up front to try to take this into, into patients. Uh, and that really changed the company now, has over 100 people, and, uh, you know, and, and, and it's been uh, very exciting to see what's happening. The next example, and this will be the last medical example, I have one other example I want to give you, is um, almost a serendipitous discovery. I had this, uh, one of my friends, Klaus Jensen, he uh, does a lot of microfluidics work, and he and I wrote a grant to the government to study how we could use microfluidic approaches to study how a gene gun can insert things in cells. So we got the student Armin Shari, and uh, let me first tell you how people normally insert things into cells. Uh, they might use uh, techniques like uh, electroporation, uh, cell penetrating peptides, uh, or nanoparticles. But all of them have different disadvantages, like off-target effects, uh, toxicity, and so forth. So what we were looking at 
and this is like motivating why we want to look at some of these gene guns to understand the fundamentals better. But I'm just going to show you a, a video on the next slide. I hope people can, will be able to see it. And it's going to be a little microfluidic chamber, but it's got a little constriction. And above it, there'll be a gene gun, and that's going to shoot the, uh, sh shoot the gene into the cell through the constriction. So here, I don't know if people can see it because of the light, but the cell goes through it, the, there's a constriction here, and the gene gun just shoots it through. I don't know, can people see that, or is that hard, too hard because of the light? Anyhow, the, um, the point I wanted to make, though, is Armin kept studying this, and one day he decided to take, a, to take away the gene gun, you know, just as a simple control. And what was amazing is he got exactly the same result as when without the gene gun as with the gene gun. Why is that? Well, what that must mean is going through the constriction is really what's key. So our thinking was if you squeeze the cell, that's really what causes the phenomena. So um, that, that was a very interesting uh, discovery. And what um, Armin started doing a postdoc, but once again, I, he came to see me one day and, I, and he was sort of sad. He said, well, I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, I, I really want to see this technology that I worked on get out to the world. So um, we started a company again. Uh, what, and Armin actually was, became the CEO of that company. He's actually very charismatic. But, of course, he had no experience doing it. So what we did there is we got, uh, this was Polaris Ventures, and I asked Amy Schulman, who was a senior partner there, who was uh, very experienced, was chief counsel at Pfizer and ran a $14 billion division, if she would be executive chair. So she would, like, coach him and give a lot of advice. And they were a great team. And so what happened is then... Uh, the company, which now is over 100 people, um, developed this uh, squeeze approach. Here it's like a million cells per second. Now they can do 10 billion cells per second. And uh, it, it, this is just uh, from some of the papers that were published. But one of the things that Armin looked at uh, for his thesis, this was published in PNAS, is, is can you get um, comparing different techniques. And, and here the idea was, could you make what's called an IPS cell? Uh, that, that's like kind of a stem cell kind of approach. And the way you do it is you take fibroblasts and then you insert one of four genes. This is what Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize for a, a, a number of years ago. And if you add them with the cell penetrating peptide, you get two colonies. Nucleofection, that's uh, electroporation, you get uh, 11 colonies. But if you use this Armin's device, the squeezing device, you get 150 colonies. And um, not only that, it's, it turns out that not only can you use this to insert almost anything in a mammalian cell, we have not gotten it to work for plant cells, but you can insert almost anything in a mammalian cell, but it also is safer. You don't get nearly as much cell death, and also you don't change the character of the cell very much. So one way that they looked at that, and this was published in PNAS last year, is what's called the transcriptome. That's the messenger RNA profile. And so if you look at the transcriptome of a control, it looks like this. It's like a fingerprint. If you look at electroporation, which is the most common method today, in fact, if you look at, say, CAR T cells, this has a, a been a very successful area of, of technology. Possibly uh, it will be a new way of treating cancer. But this, electroporation is the most common way to make uh, those, and that's what many companies are trying to do. But you change the cell enormously, whereas the squeeze approach actually is more effective and changes it much less. And because of that, and again, this is... Uh, how you, you end up uh, uh, finding, well, actually, before I say that, I should point out that uh, in uh, 2014, um, Scientific American came out with their top 10 world-changing ideas. And again, I don't know if people can see this because of the light, but they picked uh, CRISPR, Cas9 as the number one best idea th that came out in 2013, and then they picked Squeeze as the number two. Now, I, I felt they had the order wrong, but, but, it, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> and, and again, I, I, what, what we did is, I, as I mentioned, that one of the ways that we keep financing these companies is to try to get deals. And actually, usually you get deals in, in as narrow area as possible with large pharmaceutical companies. Here, what was done, and Amy and uh, Armin got a deal with Roche, which is a very large pharmaceutical company. This is about a billion-dollar deal for putting uh, these... these uh, 
genes in B cells, another immune cell, and uh, to treat cancer, and uh, 120 million dollars up front. So that enabled the company again to expand. So these are examples of, of medical ideas. I wanted to close a little bit on a non-medical idea. So one of the venture groups we do a lot of work with is Polaris, and several of my students work there. One day, one of the, my students, former students, Amir Nishat, came to see me, and he said, Bob, you know, we've given you all this money to start you know, all these medical companies, but we have a non-medical idea we wanted to pursue. I said, what is that? He said, well, we want to start a hair company. I said, okay, well, what, what, what do you want to do? He said, well, we've talked to these hairstylists, and there's this big problem. I, I said, what is it? He said, a lot of people have frizzy hair. And, you know, I'm probably one of them. So um, we decided to see if we could uh, change that. And we started this company, Living Proof, again, with Be Amir and Betty Yu, who was one of our students. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and we tried to look at this, again, from a much more fundamental way. And it turns out, as I looked at this, along with Dan Anderson, who was, again, who I mentioned was one of my former postdocs, uh, what you notice is that there's many, many products on the market to prevent frizz. And do you know that almost every single one of them uses exactly the same ingredient, silicone? They formulate it a little bit differently, but it's always silicone that does it. Now, again, if you looked at the fundamentals and you'd say, well, what is the, always you want to go to the root cause. What is the root cause of, of frizz? Well, it's, it's humidity. So if you are in a humid day you can, and you have a certain type of hair, um, you'll, it'll be humid. But when you really examine how well silicones fight humidity, this is actually a graph of increasing humidity resistance. And if you look at an isotherm, it doesn't really fight it all that well. So we took a much more fundamental look. What, what, what if you wanted to really stop frizz, stop moisture from getting in, what you'd say is, well, you need something that's to coat the hair that's light and very water repellent, very hydrophobic, very lipophilic. So what's the most hydrophobic thing any of you can think of? Is it silicone? Well, I, I won't do it as a quiz, but I'll tell you what we started thinking about. We thought a Teflon frying pan. That would be super hydrophobic. But probably you would not put a Teflon frying pan in your hair. But you could look at the chemistry. And the chemistry of Teflon is a polyfluoroester. And so we said, well, that's good, but are there any medical products that are... Of polyfluoresters. It turns out there's certain lenses that are coated with polyfluoresters, so they're safe in humans. So we examined those, and it turns out that they worked a tremendous amount better than silicone. So what we did is we uh, tested this, we patented it, and we made this whole line of no-frizz sh uh, shampoo and conditioners. And, uh, and, 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 and in fact, um, you know, these are at all kinds of stores all over the world, including Sweden. I, I, I understand that uh, the, the number two country in Europe but buying these, it turns out, uh, is Sweden, England being number one. But at any rate, let me just show you a video about this that came on television. Where better to seek out today's leading edge of invention? It's a complete no-brainer. MIT. We've done a lot of work on new kinds of implants to treat uh, brain cancer, to treat different kinds of cancer and other diseases. Bob also, Langer and Dan Anderson run one of the biggest academic research labs in the country. Langer alone has over 750 medical patents, more than anyone in the world. He and Anderson have had amazing success inventing novel medical materials and life-saving therapeutics. Well, certainly it's uh, one of the reasons I really like my job. I mean, you know, you really feel like the work you're doing on a day-to-day -day is not only scientifically interesting, but also can have a real impact on people's lives. Now, their work on stem cells and damaged spinal cords has had to make way for another vexing problem. Bad hair days. The result? No frizz. Based on Anderson and Langer's science, no frizz has taken the beauty world by storm. It's so amazing that the big companies haven't been able to solve these problems in such a short time. We've been able to really tackle problems that have really dramatically affected women for many years. You know, Rob Robillard is CEO of Living Proof, makers of no frizz. This Cambridge startup secret weapon? Science. Using renowned researchers from outside the beauty industry to apply 
new thinking to age-old problems. This side of her head was treated with one of those silicone products. Mm. This side was styled with no frizz technology. Okay. Now, we you found the holy grail for frizz. It's, it's amazing. Noted stylist Mitch DeRosa is a co-founder of Living Proof. He says until now, the fight against frizz has relied on silicone-based products, which keep moisture out, but can leave Six hair months. heavy and greasy. Along come Anderson and Langer and their discovery of polyfluoroester. And this creates a weightless shield sheathed around each hair fiber. For Langer and Anderson, there's nothing trivial about their work for a beauty product. After all, they consider themselves equal opportunity problem solvers. Do your fellow uh, professors give you a teach you sometimes about the frizzies? Or do they have a fun with it? Or they? A lot of them use it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that was actually the first set of products that they asked us about. And then they said, well, you know, can you make, uh, give hair more body? So it turns out, you know, Dan and I, we had a big project in our lab to make polymers. We were looking at polymers that we thought would be good for delivering DNA and RNA and other things. So we had, we developed this uh, whole family of polymers, poly beta amino esters, um, using, again, different combinatorial uh, chemistry techniques and we had this these giant libraries thousands of polymers in fact many of them are now being used commercially uh, as as different reagents by about five or six different companies but with, since we had this library so not only did we have these libraries we had these very broad patents on poly beta amino esters because they hadn't been synthesized before and so we had patents and they were composition of matter patents. If you have a composition of matter patent, that means you could theoretically use it for anything, whether it's gene therapy or, or, or this or anything else. So again, we developed a high throughput screen with the company now to look at hair. And we found one that uh, actually worked really well at creating more body. Here's an example with a, a young woman. So that would then lead to, um, to full, uh, which is the product shown here. And then you could also uh, combine, combine the two, and the company actually now has about uh, over 100 uh, products, but you could combine the two. They actually created this product they call PhD, that's Perfect Hair Day, and um, uh, believe me, I don't think of these things, but, uh, but, but basically you can combine them and, and, and do different things. So, but, but you know, I, I, one of the things that to me was interesting, I mean, almost everything I've done has been, you know, aimed at using materials to help in the medical area. And, and usually what we'd find is if we had good data and we got FDA approval, you know, people would use them. But the company, they hired a, a woman, Grace Ray, uh, as vice president of marketing. And when she came, she did this analysis. And I remember her telling me, she said, Bob, you know, I did this analysis. She was a Harvard MBA. She said uh, that, you know, what we found is that 95% of the people who use this like it. 95% of the people who use it reuse it. And she said, way less than 1% even know it exists. But then again, the company was very clever. They decided they would get somebody involved who, the, whose hair the world right, might recognize. And, and here's this young woman with me, um, and, uh, Jennifer Aniston. And, when, and, and so she uh, ended up becoming a, a, a major force in this. And then everybody started to know it. And the company did great. And Unilever eventually acquired it. By the way, we also did one other thing. And that is... Um, Again, I don't know how well this uh, can be seen, but, but with Rox Anderson, uh, who's a skin specialist, wondered if we could get rid of wrinkles. So we actually published this article in Nature Materials a few years ago where we came up with the skin screen, cream, uh, again, using some silicone chemistry, uh, which if you applied it, would uh, uh, get rid of wrinkles. And this uh, became a spinoff of that company called Olivo Labs, which actually Sushado acquired uh, recently. Uh, for again, to we call it second skin. Uh, so, so these are, are some examples. I, I just put a summary on the next three slides of all these companies that we started, and and, and most of them are in materials and drug delivery. Uh, a few other things, uh, but here's the, some of the early ones like Enzatech. We did get involved in a food company, Optifoods. Uh, then you know we, th here's some more. Uh, 
I should point out a couple things. Some I, I didn't necessarily give you the biggest successes or the biggest failures. A biggest success actually probably would be Moderna, which is up here. Moderna, we started uh, a couple a few years ago to create messenger RNA drugs, and that company uh, in December went public uh, with the largest biotech IPO in history, raising over six hundred million dollars overall. We've raised uh, over. $2 billion, and they have actually 11 different drugs in clinical trials, and all using nanoparticles to deliver uh, messenger RNA for cancer, for heart disease, rare diseases, and so forth. And there have been some that haven't worked uh, so well as well and uh, that are up here, and, and, and I'll try to allude to why I think some work better in, uh, in the last couple slides uh, and, and worse. So again, the next to last slide is the repeat of the very first slide. I like to think that in most cases we've had a good technology and good science and good patents and, and, and also a lot of passion, which to me is very important because the students who worked on this are really not only in the lab but actually also in the company. But in the very final slide, I, I thought I'd make some additional observations which have nothing really to do with science, uh, or not too much at least. and and yet I found have been very important to the success of some of these companies. First, if, again, if it's a medical one, it's having a good regulatory strategy. You know, one of the reasons I think that the returns were so good and we got diluted much less on companies like Momenta and, and, and uh, Air were that we were into the clinic really fast. Like Air, for example, we, the only thing we did is change geometry. So we didn't have to run into, you know, we changed the geometry of the aerosol, but not the chemistry. So we were able to get into the clinic within a year after we started. And in, in, in Momenta, it was a sort of a generic approach. Probably the single most important thing, though, when I look back at whether the companies we've done, we've started, have done well or poorly, and, and I, I, I almost hate saying this, isn't the science, it's been how good the management team is and how good in particular the CEO is. That really has made a huge difference as having, because it's always a partnership between the science and the business people. But when the, sci the, when, when the CEO has been very good at raising money and yet at the same time not over-promising, uh, very good at, at strategy, that's made a huge difference. And the opposite is also true. Um, a couple other quick points. If you're developing novel therapeutics, like another company I, that we got involved in, from, that I was involved in from the very beginning was El Nylum. And I remember what we decided to do there is, again, we were using nanoparticles to deliver siRNA. And, and, and really the decision there is to make situate, because anytime you do these things, delivery is really hard. So we wanted to pick situations where delivery was easiest. So we picked delivery to deliver. And we just got approval by the FDA of the first siRNA product ever uh, last year to treat a, a rare disease called ATTR amyloidosis, which affects uh, a number of people. I also think it's really important to create a great culture. I mean, that sounds simplistic, but I've watched over the years, you know, when people are happy and, and excited and, and can talk to the CEO and there's just a great community, it makes a huge difference. And finally, you know, I think it is very important to have really good advisors that can help the company uh, and, and, and use those people in a way to really get criticism in a constructive way about what you're doing well and, and what you're not doing well. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, but it's been, and really these are just different stories of different companies that we've, I've had the fortune to be involved in. But there's a lot of lessons that, that you end up learning from both your failures and your successes. You know, and it's really a team effort by all kinds of people, financial people, legal people, scientists, and, and so forth. And, and, and to me, it's just been wonderful. Actually, even what I've seen today right around uh, Stockholm and KTH, it's very, very exciting to see entrepreneurism because I think it can take the things that we do in, in universities and, and get them out to the whole world and just make it a better, happier, healthier place. Thanks for having me. You want me to, should I sit down? So, very inspiring. I was also, I was thinking about other keywords. You talked about the passion and, and also you, persistence seems to be something that's needed, I think. Well, uh, let's move on to the next uh, session of this uh, seminar. Um, we will have a fireside chat. So, Bob, you already took a place, and I would like to invite uh, three other professors up on stage. 
Uh, first, Sophia Hober. And uh, Sophia is Professor in Molecule Biotechnology at KTH with focus on protein engineering um, for use in biopharmical industry for purification, diagnostics and therapy. She is the inventor of more than 20 patents and uh, has also co-founded four companies. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then we have Ankesin Albertson. Uh, she's a professor emeritus and uh, in polymer technology at KTH and her achievements have contributed not only in the field of biopolymers but also the greater community of polymer science. For the past 20 years she's been editor-in-chief of American Chemical Society journal Biomacromolecules. And the last one is Niklas Rockseed. And Niklas is an associate professor in medical and micro and nanosystem at KTH and a research fellow at Bob's lab at MIT, where he works on realizing oral de delivery of biological drugs. Uh, Niklas is one of the most active KTH researchers uh, in the field of, of um, innovation, and he has more than 25 patent application and um, many of which have been licensed to medtech companies and Fortune 500 companies all around the world. Uh, recently, he, with support of KTH Innovation, started his latest startup called uh, a blood, blood sampling startup called Capitainer uh, to change the way blood samples are taken in the future. So, give the panelists a big applaud. <laughs> So, let's start with Sophia. Um, how you, you come from an area of KDH where you also do a lot of similar work that we, we heard um, Bob describe. How would you describe your research environment in relation to impact and why do you think it has become so? Okay, it's kind of interesting to listen to you because, can you hear me? I'm not sure if her sign, sound is, is on. It? It's green. it's green. Maybe okay. we use this. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's... So, um, it was interesting to listen to you, Bob, because I could see that there are a number of similarities in culture uh, at the lab that do both research and, and trying to do impact as well. And I think that, uh, to me, uh, curiosity is the most important thing that I try to, con uh, to convene to my PhD student and my group. Uh, that's the most important feature for success, I think, in, in both science and uh, trying to make patents and companies. And I think that it's necessary to build a positive and fostering environment, but still enabling atmosphere. So you can combine that with, with high expectations on your students and, and the people around. And still encourage them to come up with crazy ideas. And there's no problem if someone fails, because if you don't fail, then you haven't tried enough, I think. Uh, also, um, when thinking about this question, I, I think about my uh, background. I started as a PhD in industry, but that felt to me too narrow, because I was too much uh, steered by someone else. I have to deliver the milestones and deliverables, and, mm -hmm. and I was too curious to just stay there. So that was a good step for me to move on to academia, actually. Of course, there are deliverables and milestones also here, but, but still, I'm kind of inventing them myself. Uh, also, uh, very important to do this other part, uh, starting companies, making patents, and I think the network is very important. You, you need to collaborate with people that are interested in what you're doing, to know what problems there are, are outside the world. You can quite often end up inventing a problem because you have a solution to the problem. It might not be a real problem, but you would like to use your solution and then you invent the problem, but no one else would like to use it, actually. Uh, so that's important. And then also that you can share your ideas with people that you uh, trust, that they don't, don't take your ideas and run away to do something themselves, but you can discuss it with people that you rely on. That thing, I think that summarizes how I try to create the, the environment around me as well. Thank 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Niklas, as we heard, you spent two years at MIT working at Bob's lab. Uh, what lessons did you learn at his lab and, and what did you bring home to your lab here at KTH? Right. Um, so, uh, I, I think, yeah, sp spending about two, two years in, in, in uh, almost two years in, in Bob's lab was, was, was a great experience. Thank you for that, Bob. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I mean, I would perhaps return a bit to, to you know, Bob's uh, slides that he had here. I think um, one of the things that you always advocate is to think big, big to focus on the, on the main problem. And I think that's, that's, a, that's an extremely important thing that we forget when we try to convey why we're doing this in the first place. Uh, and, and then, you know, some other things that I, I, I thought was re really, really interesting in your lab, and, and, you know, that's really building that kind of environment that you have there where I think the postdoc or the PhD student you know, becomes the champion and starts the companies. And that kind of fosters kind of an environment where, where you know, things start to happen. And I think that's, that's really, I think that, that was really a key, to me it was a key thing in, in you know, getting things out from the university to, to, to really, you know, empower the students and to, to take the initiatives. And when they see their peers, you know, he can do it, then I can also do it. And that kind of creates a chain reaction. And that's very, very important to, to, to create that kind of environment, I think. And the third thing, uh, which I think is, is, is very much different at MIT, which, you know, that's something you also mentioned in the slides here, is to bring the technology, you know, to the, where you go into animals and do the animal testing. That, you know, shows so much more, you know, that you validate your technology before, you know, so anyone want to invest wants to see that and, and you know, take that to the, to the next step. And I, I think that's, you know, something that we don't have at KTH, you know, where we do that. I think we're setting it up right now with Karolinska. We, we, we just started a, a, a new center called MedTech Labs where we do ex animal experiments and all this. And KTH doesn't have that animal experiment. So, so I think that's, that's really, really important to take it to the next step. And, and I mean, Stockholm is great for that. I mean, we, we have Karolinska just, uh, you know, 10 minutes away from here. So um, I think that's, so that's, some, 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 that's the things that I, that I really took home to, to KTH. And I want to try to nourish here as well. Thank you. Um, anne Christine, you have a long career as a scientist, and I've learned that you and Bob know each other since many years back. <laughs> Actually, first time, one of my... Does it work? Yeah. 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 Uh, one of my first students saw his name was on a pat patent, because we were working with polyanhydride, and he had a patent on polyanhydride just when we had done this going on on this. So, my student didn't like it, but I said, <laughs> uh, he's working with something different because he was working with aromatic and I was focused on aliphatic ones because they would give us better solutions in what we wanted to do. But I admire your way to go the whole way and build up. But on the other hand, at KTH, some of us take a different position, and I have seen that, for me, the most important has been to give our students, uh, in my subject, a new kind of education. So I have instead forced that all of them should know organic chemistry, physical chemistry, and really be able to take the next step. Sure. And then we have, uh, I think this is an advantage, we have this uh, possibility to have the civil engineer that really have the background we want, and I've already always asked them to have, and then we can continue for four years with doctor's degree, and then they can travel, and I think that's something that's very important, that we have this possibility to meet, like, to meet you, so enthusiastic, and they have a person they look up to, but uh, of course not all of them can go to him, because the reason for that is that he has already far too many from all over the world that admire you. But I said, for my position, I have always focused on give the background to the students so they can to this stage. So when I'm a little curious how you succeed to have the knowledge when you need it, because I think I always have been worried that they will not have enough background in this new area with biomaterial. 
Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, again, uh, so one of the things about our, our lab, I mean, and, you know, I've made it, I think it started for me being in a surgery lab, but it's very interdisciplinary. So I, I always feel like my own knowledge is, you know, somewhat limited. So we have people, and I'm sure Nicholas saw this, who, I mean, again, like he worked with gastroenterologists, molecular biologists. So those, there's people there, who, and, and he brought in a, a, a huge expertise in microneedles and so forth. So, you know, he, so everybody kind of is in there offering things and all kind of working together. So I think the paper that we published in Science a few weeks ago, which Nicholas was an author on, I mean, the people there were like graduate students, clinicians, um, you know, all, all kinds of different backgrounds because that's veterinarians. I mean, all because it took all that to, to do that. So somehow we feel like, you know, since no one person has the expertise or even close to it, it's kind of ends up being a team effort. It's interesting, our, our building, I mean, which is kind of maybe even a model of, of, of this, you know, when I, I look at, um, mo and, and it's not to try to say there's one right way or wrong way to do it. I think all of these things are good, and I think having a, a mixture is good. But our building, you know, most of the stuff I look at MIT or most universities, there's a building for math, there's a building for uh, English, there's a building for chemical engineering. You know, our building actually has half biologists and half engineers, and the engineers are from uh, eight different engineering disciplines. So it makes it easier for people to, to I think, you know, students meet each other and form collaborations that they and postdocs and visiting scientists and that they might not normally make. So I think it's just the, that that for the kinds of projects that we do, that, that, that certainly the base is chemistry or engin chemical engineering, but then there's all these other things that, that, we, that need to be brought in. So you find people who are, are really far, far more knowledgeable than I am or, or that anybody else in the lab is, and they, they work together. So what are your thoughts when you heard the KDH perspective here and what, what they told? What do, you, what do you think about? Well, I've always had a really high regard for KTH, and I, I mean, and again, I know uh, I, I do two of the three people uh, quite well, and I enjoyed uh, hearing what, what you said. I mean, I, I think the KTH perspective is great. You know, I, th I think that, that, that if, if the question is, I mean, to me, it all starts with what Christine said is, you know, you, you have to do, none of these things would happen without really doing good fundamental basic science in the first place. And, and, and to me, that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's what she said, I think, very clearly. And uh, I, I think the entrepreneurship thing is, is a, a, almost the next step that is a career choice if some people want to do it. I should say, you know, again, if we look at us, I'm talking about entrepreneurship today. I, I have over 300 students and and postdocs who are professors too, um, and 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 so you know they're not necessarily entrepreneurs. They're doing just what Christine said. They're teaching fundamentals. But I think entrepreneurship is also a great career. Some people want to do that, and and I and I just want the students to do the things that are going to make them happiest. And everybody's different. So I think that um, the fundamentals, which she said, are first. But I think both of what you're doing and what Nicholas is doing in terms of startups, I think. That's great too. I mean, I, and I think what it does is it creates the opportunity for KTH students to have a choice of different careers uh, that they can have and, and figure out the way they want to impact the world in the best way. Yeah. So do, do you have any questions for them? I want to hear more about the blood container stuff. If I, if I could ask you <laughs> offline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a competitor to your, one of your companies. Right? Well, well, actually, the reason, <laughs> the reason I asked is somebody, uh, not to diverse too much, but there's a group in Texas, uh, and they started this company to do, you know, at-home diagnosis uh, that I agreed to do some consulting for. And it's actually, they, they've been very successful. But what they do is they just take, um, uh, you know, I think they send somebody like a Lancet to draw the blood, and then they put dried blood on something and then send it back to the company and then they send it to, to the, um, you know, some CLIA lab. And, uh, but I mean, I think that they'd love better ways to, to do this. Yeah. You know, so, so we do, we, one of our companies is looking at microneedles to draw blood, which is, would be great. Um, and we've got FDA approval for small amounts. But I also think the sampling of the blood 
must be important. And I, so that's why I'm, I'm, so that's almost like the next step. So I'd be, would love to hear more about that. Yeah. And plus I'd like to hear about all the latest things that uh, you all are doing too. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, you're on to it. I mean, that's something that drove that development a bit. In, in the microfluidics area and the micro nano system, which, which I deal with, we, we've talked, you know, quite now for 20 years about, you know, the, the lab on the chip and, 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 and doing uh, point of care testing. And I, I think, you know, one needs to just see that perhaps the bottleneck is really the sampling of the blood. Right. So the analysis is done extremely efficient today right. with, you know, millions of samples being processed at central labs under huge quality uh, control and, and you know I think that's very hard to, to, to beat so I think you know what what uh, Seven Sense is on and what what this company that the Capitaner is doing is really you know fixing the sampling event have that easily shipped into the hospital and that's uh, yeah from my perspective I, I, I you mentioned Moderna which is really uh, uh, sticks out as a as a, an amazing journey and and I, I would just you know love to hear your view on that, Bob, you know, how that came across. So Moderna is this biopharmaceutical company that, that pre-IPO raised like $2 billion or something, which is like yeah. crazy. Uh, and, and how do you see that? Uh, you know, what, what, what did be, how, how did it come, how did it start? Yeah. I mean, all, all your companies have these great stories, and, which yeah. is always amazing. And, and, and how you see really, you know, what, what is the beauty of this or what, what are you seeing this going forward? Yeah, so what happened is one of my colleagues, uh, Derek Rossi, came to see me one day because he had uh, worked out a way, you know, if you give messenger RNA one of the to a cell, one of the problems is that uh, it, it, if you gave it to a person, I should say, it would cause an interferon response. But he had uh, done a study where he'd modified the messenger RNA and it didn't give an interferon response and he had been able to create, again, an IPS cell. So he came over to see me because one of his colleagues said, gee, you should try to start a company in tissue engineering, which is one of the things that, um, that we had done before and still do. But when I saw this, I thought, gee, we could do a much bigger thing than just tissue engineering. You could really use it to make any therapeutic, particularly if you could solve the delivery problem. So, um, so, so, so that's how, how it started. We got actually Ken Chen involved, who's actually at Karolinska. He was the third founder. And, and he was particularly interested in for heart disease. So, that, so from a scientific standpoint, that's how it would start. But then uh, we also talked to Flagship. And Nubar Fayan, who's a very visionary venture capitalist, was excited about it and put some money into it. And that's how it got started. And then the other key thing was both Nubar and I knew somebody, a, a man named Stefan Bansell. And he had been, he was CEO of a major public company, but we talked to him about this. And he was just an amazing fundraiser. So he became a CEO. And, 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 he's, and he's also very visionary. And then we hired a bunch of other people, really top scientists, Melissa Moore, who's a National Academy member, uh, Stephen Hogue, who's actually an MD, PhD, but just brilliant. And, you know, many, many others, quite a few of my students uh, go on there, like Jeff Hercash and others, to do the nanoparticle work. Uh, and so that's how it got started. And then we just kept raising money. But one of the key things was getting a deal early with AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca, and so we took one thing, uh, heart disease, and said, could you come up with nanoparticle mRNA formulations to you know, help people with heart disease, maybe grow more new blood vessels, building on some of the angiogenesis work that we had done years ago. And so they gave, and, and, and these guys just sat in a room till the deal closed. It was just, you know, and, and they did. And it was $240 million up front, and ultimately, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars back-ended. And that really enabled the company to expand and do a lot, and, and yet only give up heart disease so that they could pursue cancer and then you know we raised more venture money and got more deals big deal two huge deals with Merck on vaccines and um, you know and then went public in December you know with 11 things in the clinic 
So, and again, it's, it's what I call a very high risk, very high reward kind of company. I mean, may end up not doing well at all. On the other hand, it, it could change the history of medicine because, you know, the beauty of mRNA therapeutics is unlike even proteins, which are now some of the biggest selling drugs, mRNA, you know, can do things that proteins can't do. First, they can make proteins themselves and use the body as the factory rather than spend a year doing it. Secondly, you can make the mRNA in a month or less so that you could, like say, if somebody had a flu vaccine or something, you could, you know, really make it quickly. And finally, you can get into a cell. So if there's intracellular targets for the disease, you can do that as well. So it opens up all kinds of new, you know, clinical opportunities. So my hope is that it'll do very well, but we're still, you know, nothing's approved yet. But, you know, we, we, we like to think that it could change history. We'll see. <laughs> I was thinking, you, you said before that you wanted to hear a little bit more about yes. medicine. Sophia, you co-founded four companies. Do you have any examples from any of those you would like to share? Yeah, actually, I'm working with the proteins then, not mRNA. But I really know well, we all you said about mRNA, that it makes some part easier. But uh, for me, it's uh, tailor-making proteins to target different uh, things in, in the body. It could be therapy or it could be uh, detection. Sure. Like now we have a protein that actually is in clinical trials for detection of breast cancer. Well, that great. actually goes very, very it's nicely great. forward. So, yeah, it's fun with protein as well. Yeah, well, yeah. well, proteins is how we get started. So yeah, I, exactly. I, it's, it's more safe to work, work with therapeutics proteins than, than mRNA oh, so sure. far. Sure. Question for you, Bob. I uh, admire your journey, and you have started a large number of companies. So this question is in two parts. Firstly, how long do you hang on closely with your upstart company before leaving it? Because sometimes it can be a bit hard for the new CEO and the management team to have the founder shaking them all the time. And the second question is, uh, how do you find energy? and happiness in going further, since you have done so much already? Sure. Well, th those are very good questions. So the first one, you know, the analogy I usually um, give, and actually my son's here, so this relates to that too, you know, is, is that I kind of view these companies almost like children growing up. And, and what I mean by that is when you first start it, it needs a lot of your nurturing and a lot of your time, because it's like a baby, and, and, um, and you, you have to sort of do everything, whether it's, you know, raising the money, working on the patents, hiring, you know, people. But then it gets, you know, after a couple of years, it gets bigger and, and bigger and bigger. And I guess my feeling is, you know, you know, as, as a baby gets older, it needs you less. You actually want them to need you less. And then when it gets a lot older, they may want your help a little bit or they might not want it at all. And to me, it actually doesn't matter. I want to do what will ever make the company happiest. So if the company wants me to stay and do something like be on a board of directors, I, I do it. If they don't, I'm, I'm, I'm happy as long as the, hopefully the company does have, well. Have they kicked you, kicked you out sometimes because you had different views on the future? Yeah, actually, I don't know that I've, I don't think I've been kicked out, but, you know, sometimes management changes. You know, I, I'd say that, um, I mean, again, I'm not the kind of board member that, like, see, some board members are very controlling, and I'm, I'm really not. Like, I, I like to just give advice, and I've, I've, I've lived long enough to know that a lot of people won't take my advice, and, and I think that's okay. You know, I just... Uh, but but I'm not sure that that necessarily makes me the greatest board member. I mean, some some board members are really tough and they'll fire people. That's not necessarily my strong point, you know. So, uh, but maybe because of that, I don't. I, they're not want to kick me off either. Probably you're more useful, just giving no. advices as well. Well, I don't know. And and the second question, finding the energy. I don't know. I love this. I mean, to me, you know, the more people we can help, the more students that go through and are happy, and you know, the more things that get out, I, I, that, that makes me happy. I mean, so, so it's not only about not giving up, as you said in the beginning of your speech today. Well, I think, see, in the beginning, it's about not giving up because nothing, nothing was working or nobody would hire me. Now, I don't have that problem as much, but, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that, then that was a huge problem. But still, I guess, to, to drive an idea all the way to a company, it's also very much of not giving up. I mean, yes, it's never I, I, an easy journey. I agree. Being persistent, as we said. Well, I think uh, um, our time is almost up, 
And before we, we end, I would like to have a final question to all of you. Uh, and I would like to give you a short, short answer. And the question is, how has your work with impact made you a better scientist? So, would you start, Christine? I think uh, to be uh, in a world where everything is happening and meet exciting people all over the world, that is one part of it. And the other part is that you have these young people, and I have had many graduate students, and see how they develop and come out, and like one of them have tremendous amount of patents on degradable polymers. It's one of them that started with this looking on your patents. <laughs> and so I think th this is what really drives you further and wants to know more. But on the patent side, then you have to be a special to not fail because you have someone have to pay and I always think, how should I pay next time for this stupid patent? <laughs> <laughs> so I think for me, this is really it's more and more exciting, and there are more and more things I want to know. That you see, I'm sitting here, which I shouldn't, as all of you can see. But uh, that's, I think that's a driving force. And you are also sitting here, even if you are nearly the same age. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, who would continue? Niklas, your turn. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, I would go back to what Bob said earlier. Uh, I mean, we, nowadays, we, I think we talk a lot about the impact at, at KTH uh, has been, been kind of a focus throughout the, the recent years. Um, but, but I mean, I, I think so what has, imp you know, my work on impact, how has that changed things? Well, I mean, going back to what Bob says, focus on the, on the big problem. I mean, that's, if you do that, you're kind of make yourself impactful. Uh, and it, I think that di directs you as a scientist also to, you know, perhaps do, do important stuff. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. And Bob, would you like yeah. to continue? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to 100% answer the question, but I, I was going to give a sort of perspective as a professor relating to what both you said. You know, one of the things that I've thought about a lot is you know, what do I want to achieve as I, one of the things I want to achieve as a faculty member. And what I watch when I look at students come into the lab as graduate students and postdocs, you know, up until that time when somebody's in grammar school, high school, college, you know, the way they're judged is by how good their answers are to other people's questions. You know, they get an A or a B or whatever, and that's how they get judged. But, you know, in life, you know, you're not just judged by the answers you give. In fact, one of the most important things is the questions you ask. And, and, and so the way I think about the impact question that you're asking is one of my goals as a professor is to help students now in the graduate stage or, or postgraduate stage cross that bridge from somebody you can just give good answers to now somebody you can ask good questions. And I think Nicholas said it well. I want people to ask really important questions because and I hope that they can find the answers too, but, but at least if you ask big questions, you have a chance to, to, to do something very significant. Yeah, that's, that's true. So, so, Sophia, you're lost. <laughs> yeah, I'm lost. Yeah, the connection between doing good, good or high impact and, and being a good scientist, to me, it's not a very clear connection. But I think that you might be another scientist by trying to do impact. Uh, and probably the main thing is that you broaden your perspective and you're working more like a, a bigger network. And as Bob said before, you have to hire people that know what you don't know yourself in order to come further with, with impact. And you might not be so much into the nitty gritty details of things, but having a broader view, I think. Uh, but being a scientist, to me, and I agree really with you, it, the main part is to see the people around you develop and taking more part in the decision and also helping out with the development of, of a project. If you start ha having a bachelor student, for example, and then see that one grows to a researcher, that's really rewarding. Okay, thank you so much for a very very good panel discussion, I, I believe. Um, big applause to the panelists. We have some gifts here for all of you. I will give you 
one each, and Thank then I you. will tell you a little bit what it is. Um, I keep this one. I need to show what it is. <laughs> this is actually um, this is actually a flick button. I don't know if you heard about them before, but it's developed by KTH students, and it's a wireless Bluetooth button that you can connect to your phone, and you can actually control basically everything on your phone with it. You can connect it to your favorite Spotify list, or you can connect it to turning on and off the lights in your house, or, or to, to Runkeeper or RaceFox, perhaps. <laughs> As one of the investors is sitting up here, so. Um, so this is what you all get from us. And thank you so much, and thanks again, Bob, for, for visiting pleasure. us and staying here at, at uh, KTH together with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. And yeah. And to all of you, thank you for being here and sharing this lunch seminar together with us. And remember where to turn to if you have ideas and you want to try to see if you can take them to the market. As we said, it all starts here. Goodbye. Have a nice day. <laughs>